Can we have our first slide? Thanks very much. Oh, I've got to turn something on, haven't I? So we bit of background. Exodus chapter 20 and uh, verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the, mo- the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Now we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34. The scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees were approaching Jesus again. Verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with your, all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So this morning we're going to look at how we shall live godliness with contentment. Over the last three weeks we've been looking at into, um, into Exodus chapter 20 and the different instructions, the different commandments that the Lord gave us. And last week, Wilf brought to us, you shall not steal. And this week, we're going to look at, you shall not covet. I know that's not the title up there, but we'll get, we will come to that. Now, godliness with contentment. Godliness is, uh, I looked this up, and it's holiness and righteousness. Now, those are words that aren't very common today, but let's just look at them. Holiness, that means belonging to God and being devoted to him. Righteous means being pure of heart and conduct and being honest. This is what should characterise a believer. Israel was in the wilderness. They had just come out of that big event when they came out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt, sorry, and they had been immersed in a culture where there were so many false gods. They were immersed in a, a structure of society where there was slave and then there was free person. And now they found themselves in the wilderness. The organisation had gone. The food on the table wasn't there. They murmured and they grumbled. They complained. There was individual issues regularly and I think Moses spent a lot of his time at first sorting out the differences that people had. So God brought his rules, his commands to them. He clearly, as we've read, directed them towards himself being the one true God. He gave them guidelines, rules to live by. So what we're going to look at today is not an academic exercise. It is actually really, really valuable. It's what God has given us. And so 
let's, let's pray that he's, he will help us to be encouraged and to understand what he's saying to us this morning. Our loving Father, God, we thank you that you have sent us your Son, the Lord Jesus. And he's confirmed and affirmed everything that you gave when you said that you were the, the one to be served, the one to be loved with all our heart and soul and strength. Our Father, we ask this morning that you would help us, please, to have ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray as we read your word that your spirit will take your word and take it deep into our minds, into ourselves that you would instruct us and guide us is our prayer and request this morning, Father. For your glory we ask in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So, our focus, you shall not covet, and being contented, living a life that pleases God. A covet is a word that's not used very often. In fact, I hardly ever see it used at all. But strangely enough, you do come across it from time to time. I saw it just the other day, first time in ages. And it described a person that was waiting for their car to be warranted. They were anxious, longing for that little ticket that gave them six months of free motoring, or assured motoring, because their car had passed. You see, that was a, a very light expression of coveting. But you know, coveting starts off with a longing, a deep longing to possess. Especially for longing for something that belongs to someone else. And it's possible that we can trace back coveting from uh, trace back to coveting all different kinds of, of wrongdoing. If it's theft, bodily harm, unfaithfulness, idolatry, these could be traced back to a single coveting thought. And then when we put relationships and possessions too high in our lives, then our desires start to get directed towards those and there's no place for God in our lives and that's where the New Testament reminds us that coveting which is idolatry and we've got to be careful let's read that command the eight, eight command the, the, the last commandment sorry in Exodus 20. The Lord God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now we'll notice that coveting takes place right inside. We see steel, everyone can seal steel, they can see stealing, they can see theft. A lot of other sins are very out there. But coveting starts inside here. What did Jesus say in Matthew 15, verse 19, when the, um, again the Pharisees and the scribes were challenging him and about his disciples not washing their hands before they were eating their food and not doing this and that. But Jesus says, it's out of the heart that evil thoughts, murder, adultery, immoral immorality, Theft, false witness, and slander come. Now, love does no wrong to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's what, what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans. Love does no wrong. So we've just, we just covered that, that coveting was longing for something that especially belongs to someone else. Pretty clear in that, in that scripture that we've just read. All those possessions, anything that is your neighbour's, the Lord rules out. Other words we might come across, we might come across greed, envy, lust, craving, longing after. 
So these words have got a similar meaning to covet. You'll notice that coveting your neighbour's possessions is nowhere near to loving your neighbour. When we love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength and our neighbour as ourselves, we are actually protecting our neighbour. Love does no wrong to our neighbour. Now it has been said that coveting is the seed of greed. Yes, it's okay to want things. It's okay. We might need more space for our family. It's, a couple may have an eager desire to, 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 um, to, to have a home with more space for their children. But it's not okay to want something that belongs to somebody else. That word desire there is telling us that it's that deep longing that we've got to watch out for. So let's, I know these are, these are simple thoughts and I hope that we can all identify with what goes on in our own minds and not be blind. We know that we have good thoughts, we have good reflections. We recognise that those good thoughts can be directed to the benefit of others. But we've got to admit that even our good thoughts are usually geared to our own benefit. Before we were believers, before we followed the Lord Jesus, we used to think sometimes about being good. We used to think about being fair and honest and okay and acceptable. But, as I say, deep down, if we examined our motives, we might find that they were actually self-centred. When our thoughts become strong desires that are steered towards ourselves, then we have the birth of coveting. It can cause a chain of events if it's left unchecked. We think, we want... We look around and we say, hmm, I want that. The only trouble is it belongs to somebody else. As a believer, we might look around and say, oh, I'm just so pleased that uh, I've got this and uh, now I want this to be just right. I want... I want this, whatever it might be, it might be a home, it might be a garden, it might be the way that I look... But nothing gets in the way of that being satisfied. If that needs it, if that possession or that object in our life that we put so high, if it needs something, it gets it. No problem, no questions asked. It's taking too high a position in our lives. We get discontent. We're going to just quickly take some lessons from King Ahab. King Ahab, it's a long time ago. You probably say, why are we looking at this, this event? This, was, this is thousands of years ago. But boy, there's some very simple lessons to pick out from King Ahab. Now, the background for King Ahab, as soon as he became king, he didn't honour God. He was off worshipping false gods. He... He married someone that the Lord didn't want him to marry from another nation. But in chapter 21, we read something of, of Ahab which helps us see the train of events that we need to be on our guard for. So I know we know the story pretty well, but we're just going to pick out some key points as I read through. Naboth, a Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And after this, this is an event that had gone before, Ahab said to, Nahab, to, sorry, to Naboth, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house. I'll give you a better vineyard for it, if it or if it seems to good to you, I will give you money, whatever its value is. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers 
And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Nahab the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. Ahab lay down. He would eat no food. He lay on his bed, turned away his face. He went sullen, he went sulky, he went depressed. He got got angry. He wasn't getting his own way. Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money or else. If it please you, I will give you another vineyard. um, But but Naboth said, um, Naboth answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful and I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So we can see that there was nothing wrong with his initial desire. It seemed okay. But it was someone else's. It was convenient for him. And not to draw it out too much, cost was no problem. I'll give you money. He already had vineyards, but I'll give you another vineyard. He wanted, he wanted that for the convenience of himself. No doubt about it. And we can see that sin is destructive. And coveting is no exception. It started out as just an innocent thought. Notice that his behaviour affected his wife's behaviour. When we sin, there's knock-on effects. There's collateral damage all round. Destructive damage. But God, later in the chapter, he confronts um, Ahab through Elijah and he, he charges Ahab as being guilty because we know the story. If we don't, it's in 1 Kings chapter 21. Sadly, tragically, Naboth was murdered, but God held Ahab responsible. Let's look over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and we read of the parable of the the rich fool. So do we need to be careful about covetousness? Well, look at the Lord's words in Luke chapter 12. He said, take care. This is verse 15. Be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns, I'll build larger ones, and I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is the thought, sorry, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. In Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 18, the rich, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, 
so that they may take hold of what is truly life. In New Zealand here, I think that we are rich physically. If we compare ourselves with so many countries of the world where there's no running water and we don't all have two cars or we have, we, we have money to afford fares for buses, we've got transport, communication, we have, we have, well, yeah, we have so much. So we are rich physically. We are rich physically. We could have said that the, the par- in the parable of the rich fool that maybe he was contented. He said to himself, I've got all of this. I'm a barns of fool. I can, I, can, I can settle back now. That's a kind of worldly contentment. But it's not being rich toward God. The Lord Jesus, he, he said, he said, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself. His soul was required and whatever he had built up was just going to go who knows where? That person is not rich toward God. The person who is rich toward God is, is the one who is rich in good works and generous and ready to share. John the Baptist, he, he clearly showed us the evidence of the change. Whoever has two tunics is to share with the one who has none. And the same with food. Whoever has food, share with him who has none. So I want to suggest to you that the opposite of covetousness could be contentedness. Not a, not a dictionary definition. You won't go and find that or, or, or something. But I, if we get, if we get um, absolutely obsessed with longing thoughts for, for, for obsession, obsession or obsessed with owning things, that starts to take the place and our focus off God, then there's real concern. We're going to look into 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, it's well-known verses, but you know, just like Wilf said um, last week, it's so good to be reminded of what Scripture says regularly. So important. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and, and verse 6. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Some great verses in Proverbs, Proverbs 30, well known to us too, but let's, let's look at those again. This is the one where the psalmist, sorry, the, the proverb writer talks about, well, requests God actually, for him to give him just what he needs. And we'll read this together. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. When we profane the name of God, we dishonor God. We claim that we're a believer, we, we claim that we believe and trust the Lord Jesus. But when we steal, we blaspheme his name. We do not honour him. We are guilty. That's a great prayer. Now I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that no one should own possessions. Okay to own possessions. We're talking about the motives in the heart. We can own possessions and we can share willingly. We can give opportunities. It's not... This is not about not having possessions. It's our motives. So being content, what does it look like? 
if we're not content with ourselves, just how the Lord God has made us, we've got a problem. If we're not content about our appearance, our height, our abilities, we're as good as saying, Lord, I'm just not happy with how things are, the way that you've, the way that I am in you. We're forgetting that the Lord has put us with all different kinds of abilities. Just as he says through Paul in Corinthians, the hand is not a foot. I forget the exact orders, but you know what I mean? The ear is not an eye. We all have different roles. So let's not look at someone else and say, oh man, I just wish that I could, I could do Excel like him. <laughs> or something, you know? Let's be content where we are. Let's thank God for who we are, how he has made us, and the abilities that he's given us. Let's be content with our loved ones. And I'm speaking so much to myself because content, contentedness is a real challenge. I personally find it a real challenge. If Judith was, she would say, and she regularly does, well, I say, I wanted to do so much more today. I just have, well, what have you achieved, she might say. So I'll say, oh, we'll go through what we, well, let's be grateful we've achieved those things. Let's be grateful that we've come back in one piece. Let's, there's so, you know, there's so much to be grateful for. Isn't it easy to criticise our loved ones, the people who are nearest to us? Because our spouse doesn't hang up the, the cloth where they should Oh, they're going to get it. I'm going to, that's annoyed me. That's ter- that, you know, the critical spirit, let's recognise it as being alien to the believer. Our circumstances. Let's see our, our blessings around us. We've touched this already. But do you know, I have a very strong feeling that outward con- contentedness reflects a heart that praises God and thanks God. Because as soon as we start to praise God and thank him and recognise what he's done in our lives and for those around us, all those thoughts of being discontent, they just seem to melt away. And that's, that's a tremendous blessing in itself. So I think that's probably worth repeating. I think that if we can praise God and thank God and encourage one another, because isn't that what the scripture says? Encourage one another with songs and scriptures and spiritual songs. Great opportunity. You don't even know how that might take another person from a a vexed, sullen heart to an uplifted heart because you reminded them to praise and give thanks to God. That's how we can build each other up. So, in summary, make no apologies for the repetition because I think it's good to read. I don't know if you're like me, I can read something once and it's straight through. So, we'll read them again. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. Be on our guard. They were the Lord's words. And in Ephesians we read that impurity or covetousness must not even be named amongst us. The psalmist David, he writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then in Psalm 146, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. And then some words from Philippines. I'll put my glasses on. Philippines chapter 4, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am, sorry, I'll read that again. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content.
So I suggest in wrapping up that if we are able to seek God, to praise him, to thank him, to thank him for his blessings, I suggest the more content we will be and the less opportunity there will be for coveredness to develop in our lives. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we confess before you that we are weak. You know our flesh. and You know our, the way in which often we want to do things, but we fail. And we ask you for your forgiveness, Father. We are sorry that we grieve your heart when we long for things which are not what you want us to have. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be on our guard, that you will protect us, protect our marriages, protect our loved ones, protect our children from the world, Father, and even from the times that we might try and overrule or we get occupied with thoughts which are not gracious and we try to dictate when we have a critical heart, a condemning spirit. So much of this is foreign, Lord, is not what you want us to do. We read, Lord, right at the very beginning, Lord God, that you do not want us to sin. You have given us the ways to live a holy life. You have not left us with no clue on what to do. And so we pray that you will help us to encourage one another. We pray, Lord, that you will remind us to speak about your word as we sit down at the table as we walk along the paths with our families, with those that we love, those that we know. We pray that your word will guide us and will dwell in our hearts. We pray against coveting in this fellowship. Our Father, we pray that you'll help us to be a mature group of believers who can approach one another in love, that we can encourage one another to to grow in our walk with you to praise you and to give thanks for all the blessings that you've given us. Finally, Father, we thank you for this place that we have here. We thank you that we can freely read your word together. We thank you, Father, that we are blessed that each of us can turn to your word. Help us to really appreciate and to take hold of the opportunities you have given us. And we ask this and all these things, Father, for your glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.